Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the group exhibit for hydrogen fuel cells and batteries here at the Hanover Fair 2017. Uh, please come in, sit down, have a drink. The drinks are complimentary. Uh, my name is Michael Sinclair, and I'll be the moderator for this next discussion. I'd like to remind you that audience questions are welcome at any time, so please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll bring the microphone to your table. Here to join me uh, up on stage, uh, or actually the title of the talk um, that we're going to speak about today is uh, the pressure is up 900 bar electrochemically. We had a title change. We're talking about even higher pressures than 350 bar. Uh, joining me on the stage will be the B VP of Business Development from Ginner Incorporated. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Hector Maza. Hello, Michael. How are you? Thank you very much for uh, joining us, uh, Hector. Um, Thank you for inviting. Perhaps you could start by introducing your company, sure. uh, the products uh, that you serve, uh, that you make, and the markets that you serve. Sure. Um, well, this is our fifth year here in the Hanover Messe Show. Um, it's the 44th year of the company. We've been around for a long, long time. We're actually the first PEM electrolyzer company in the world, uh, the oldest, I guess, and I think we're the leader in technology these days. We are based in Newton, Massachusetts. We have a worldwide operation today with uh, local representatives in Germany, India, etc. And uh, we collaborate with many of uh, the present companies, including some of our competitors, when they need to go to higher pressures, differential pressures, things like that. We, we like to help out the industry uh, as we can. You mentioned when we spoke before that uh, Ginner has some interesting news. Yes. Uh, tell us about what's going on at Ginner. Yeah, um, actually, uh, it's, uh, we, we had a press release yesterday and we announced the uh, creation of uh, Ginner ELX, which happened uh, just a month ago. Uh, Ginner ELX is a spin off of uh, Ginner Inc. Ginner Inc. has uh, three main uh, focus areas. One is the R&D side, which is Ginner Labs. The other one is the biomedical side, which is uh, a spin off on its own, Ginner Life Sciences. But the most interesting one for this uh, venue is actually Ginner Electrolyzers. That's why we call it now Ginner ELX instead of just Ginner. Uh, yet, we bring over all the expertise from 44 years with uh, production, engineering, sales, etc. And uh, also, I understand you have a new investor. Yes. yes, uh, yes and who, who are they and what, uh, what advantage do, do they bring to the table? We have an investor which is taking a minority stake position in Guinea ELX. Um, the investor is the company called H2B2. They are a global company as well. They have a headquarters in the US. They have a big presence in Spain, of course, and, and, and some other countries. Um, the interesting thing about this group is they have a lot of experience building very, very large installations. They come from the former Avengoa Hidrogeno, which is a very large Spanish company. They did a spin-off out of that and they focus tremendously now in, uh, in the electrolyzer business. They have experience in much broader um, uh, uh, integrations, not just the electrolyzer side, but everything that goes around the electrolyzer, the storage, the compression, the dispensing, um, when it's have an energy storage going to the, uh, to the end user, the off-takers, and securing also PPA agreements on the front side of the equation. It sounds like it's a very strategic investment. Yes, it is. Uh, it is a strategic investor, and uh, we are actually uh, playing very well with them. But uh, as I said before, we also have to collaborate with sometimes even uh, competitors. I like to call them competitors because we, they're a customer, they're a competitor sometimes. But uh, in the end, this is a, a very small industry still, but growing very rapidly. And I think uh, the growth that is exhibiting right now in the multi-megawatt scale cannot be even supplied by all the competitors combined. So it's something that's going to be very very exciting for us, and we're trying to make everybody succeed as well as, as we do. So in some cases, we may sell a stack, in some others, we might do a full integrated system, and we could do this with various different uh, combinations, depending on what the customer needs at the time. The talk uh, today is, t is called The Pressure is Up, 900 yeah. bar electrochemically. Yes. You know, what does that mean? Why high pressure? And uh, yeah, let's talk about that first. Well, we always try to get you know, a, a, a catchy uh, subject in the matter. We've been traditionally known for a very high-skilled R&D, very uh, uh, bleeding edge of the technology in PEM. But uh, I think most people have been focusing lately too much on CapEx and very little on the total cost of ownership. When we start looking at the total cost of ownership of the hydrogen molecule itself, when you were to compete with somebody like uh, Gray Hydrogen, the, the big uh, gas companies here, uh, 
what you're missing is that the electrolyzer is just a very small portion of it. Then you have the compression, then you have uh, purification. You have many other stages that actually may cost as much or more than the actual initial cost of the electricity itself. So high efficiency is part of the equation, but then trying to go to uh, higher pressures becomes a real challenge. Compressors, as we know it, and we heard it from companies like Garlikid, Linde, and many others, that say, well, our compressors bought from somebody else happen to break down very often, and that's downtime. Forget about what the compressor costs. The downtime of not having the service of the molecule of hydrogen available in the marketplace is extremely high. So it sometimes could pay off to have a steady production of hydrogen, even if you are able to supply and have redundancy on the system at high pressures without having to be limited by the compressor. Some companies have tried this. We did this in the past. We did 350 bars straight from the stack. Uh, the problem is it was not commercial at the time. It was seven years ago. Now uh, we've been challenged by the Department of Energy. said, can you do it for 900 bar? Can you do it in a feasible way? And we said, yes, it can be done. So they granted us, uh, we, we won an award for $3 million recently, and we're working actively on that. I'm glad to report that we are six months ahead of schedule with fantastic results. Uh, we're up to 350, crossing that bar barrier now, and we're going to get to 900 bar. The key is, can we do it cheaper than it has been done before? And yes, we can. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, but in reality, we can. And we have uh, accomplished about three times cheaper than our closest competitor today. So uh, I guess maybe my first question on that is, you know, that's a very high pressure. I guess what are the unique challenges they have to deal with at those pressures? Oh, well, <laughs> there's a lot of challenges. Hydrogen is the smallest, the smallest molecule on the universe, so when you're trying to compress mechanically, for example, you have all, all these moving parts, and being the smallest molecule, you can easily leak uh, from, from any of these uh, moving parts. Uh, eventually, those moving parts break down. When you do electrochemical compression, you have zero moving parts. And instead of having water coming in, splitting into hydrogen and oxygen, having hydrogen and oxygen present in both sides of the membrane, in this case, what we have is just hydrogen in, hydrogen out at different pressures. The amount of energy required to do this compression is less than one-tenth of what it is to do the actual electrolysis itself. And now, if we can do that efficiently, which we do, and now bring down the cost of that in high flow rates, that would be like the holy grail for, for the industry. So it sounds like the approach that you're taking, like you mentioned, is very focused on um, you know, optimizing the cost of the entire system, yes. uh, including the balance of plant, but also including the operating costs. Absolutely. Uh, some customers come to us and say, um, can you get me this efficiency? I said, absolutely, we can give you 99% efficiency. But the problem is, at what current density we would do that? So we can mimic, for example, our, our, some of the companies here from Alkaline side, when they run at 200, 300 milliamps per centimeter square, we could be at high 90, 90%, so we could be 95, 96%. But if we want to get the most out of the stack or the system already in place, basically maximize your capex expenditure, we want to go to the other side of that polarization curve where we end up at maybe 80%, but we're running 10 times the current density that most of, our, of those competitors are able to do. In some of the, that's, that's when you have cheap electricity to run with. When you have very expensive electricity, you want to move to the left of the curve and you want to be able to run at very high efficiencies the whole system, not just the stack itself. And that's where we optimize for different customers, different parts of the equation, whether it's CapEx, whether it's OpEx. At the end of the day, the customer cares about the total cost of the molecule itself, not just one part of the equation. You mentioned uh, that you're working, or you got some funding from the Department of Energy in the United States. Uh, you guys are based in the US, of course. Uh, the goal from the DOE is uh, to achieve $4 per kilogram uh, yeah. of hydrogen yes. uh, by 2020. Yes. Uh, I guess, what is the current best in class, and what will it take to get there? Wow, <laughs> that's a lovely question. Um, there's a lot of components to the, to the cost of hydrogen, of course. The biggest component is usually electricity. So if you provide electricity at uh, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, American cents or Euro cents, it doesn't matter, you're going to be at, a, at least immediately inputting five dollars or five euros to the kilogram of hydrogen right there, just on electricity. You haven't paid for any capex, you haven't paid for any maintenance, anything around it. However, there's some other, other places where you can actually get electricity for one, two, three cents kilowatt hour. In that case, you're contributing only to one to one and a half dollars or euros, whichever is the case, to the, to the kilogram of hydrogen. So then we can today 
produce at $5 if we have the right pricing of electricity. We could certainly go to $4, but it's going to be, we have to consider all the factors in, in, in each lo locality. Obviously, we can do that, and we're working to minimize all the other costs that are dependent on us. The cost of electricity is something that it's not dependent on us, but we can choose who to partner, partner with to get some agreements in place for long-term agreements with a cost and rate of electricity to be able to supply the $4 that, uh, that the Department of Energy wants. You ask who's the best in class today. I'll give you a point of reference. The hydrogen refueling stations in California today are selling somewhere between $12 and $16 per kilogram. The best in class, you would think, well, maybe a reformer can do cheaper. Absolutely, a reformer can do it for $1.50 a kilogram at the reformer. Then you have to transport it to the end to the actual final customer. When you finish doing that, you're at $8, $10 delivering to the distributor who's just dispensing it, compressing and dispensing it. Well, all this process, you could do exactly the same with a large electrolysis in, under one roof at 5, 10, 20 megawatts, and then distribute it to the close-by locations of uh, hydrogen refueling with one benefit, which would be green hydrogen instead of gray hydrogen. And in some states, like in California and many places in Europe, they have a premium for that because you, you, we are decarbonizing the economy. That's the whole point of, of, of doing electrolysis. Otherwise, you would just keep on reforming. So in order to get to that $4 per kilogram range, we need to be leveraging the cheap electricity that renewables are providing into yes. wholesale markets, for example, yes. when the wind is uh, blowing and the sun is shining. Yes. Um, as you know, <laughs> the wind blows when, uh, sometimes harder at night than it does at the day, and you don't need that much electricity at night. You can't push it into the grid. So what do you do? You want to store it. Are you going to store it in batteries? I don't think so when you're talking about gigawatts. So you have to go to hydrogen, or you have to go to another means, maybe hydro, but then you need two lakes in that location, things like that. So at the end of the day, the best thing you can do is take advantage of the low cost of electricity when it's available, and take advantage of the low cost of capex when you don't have low cost of, of energy. At the end of the day, you go to hydrogen, and then you can distribute the hydrogen all over the map. You can go into applications for, for chemical installations. We have several talks today with, uh, with some of the uh, petrochemical plants that actually would like to use it to go from CO2 into uh, high value products, which are either liquid fuels or other. And, uh, and you can also go into food, uh, margarine production, you can go into uh, cooling plants, or ultimately you can go into mobility like we do today in the California market. So it has a broad range of uh, operation. So today in many markets, including Germany, including California, we have these uh, major price swings in, uh, in wholesale electricity markets because of the, the high penetration rates of renewables. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any sense of you know, how much hydrogen would we have to be producing to kind of lose that advantage, right? If every time power goes cheap, uh, the demand might actually, you know, for hydrogen would respond and consume more load and consequently the demand would go up and the price would go up. Is, the, is there a sustainable solution in there or by the time we get to scale on hydrogen, is electricity going to be too expensive to make it viable? Is it a chicken and the egg situation? That's, a, that's another very loud question. Well, yes, yes and no. We, we can actually optimize for that. One of the virtues of PEM is it allows us to react very quickly to sudden changes. So if the wind stops blowing, we can turn down or turn up very, very rapidly within milliseconds our electrolyzer. Something that other technologies are a little bit limited on, we can easily swing up and down both pressure, temperature, efficiencies. We can play with all those uh, current densities and adapt to the market conditions. The key is to optimize the system for the particular location and the foreseeable changes in, in, in conditions. So I think that we can certainly make it a real viable solution. We are a very different company than most. We are not future pricing. We are real day pricing. We want to make sure that every transaction we make, we make at least one dollar of profit. We cannot sell with future prices hoping that sometime we'll catch up. We have always been profitable. That's a very big difference from the big departure from most of what uh, we see in some of our competitors. They happen to be running red numbers and they're happy to do that selling the future. I don't think that's where we should be. I think we should be pricing accordingly to what we can do today and make sure that we have a profitable business for ourselves and for our customers, always. Otherwise, we're just playing this uh, catch-up game and, and eventually it's going to catch up to you. You cannot get the next investor in to pour in the next $5 million or $10 million that you're burning every year. We are, we are a little bit more conservative in that regard, but uh, we think our strategy is going to pay out in the long run. We've been doing this for longer than most around here. Yeah, 40, over 40 years. 44 years, yes. Uh, we were founded in 1973. Are there any questions from the audience? 
that's fine. Uh, I'll ask you another question about uh, about kind of the, the grid and the integration of hydrogen into the grid. Yes. A lot of renewables <clears throat> are being adopted into the grid in a distributed manner, you know, especially residential solar. But uh, I, I mean, I guess you could say, you know, I guess solar is the main is the main thing. What um, what will happen with hydrogen infrastructure? Will it be uh, integrated into the grid also in a distributed manner, or will it be more of a centralized asset uh, like a conventional power production? The biggest myth that we had in uh, California when we arrived was everybody wanted to have an electrolyzer in each gas station. Few people thought about how many cars come to a gas station every day. Many more than 100. To fuel 100 cars, you would need about 400 to 500 kilograms a day. That's one megawatt. If you want to do 200 cars, that's two megawatts. All of a sudden, you think about it and say, OK, can I bring two megawatts of power to every gas station in America? The amount of copper that's required to bring that kind of power, that transformer, all the around installation to be able to supply stacks and systems inside each one of these powers, uh, uh, HRS, uh, hydrogen refueling stations, would be incredible. So that's not a viable solution. The viable solution, that's viable, obviously, when you're in a remote location and you can do nothing else but to put the electrolyzer there. We think the viable solution is to actually have, under one roof, 10, 20, 50 megawatts available right next to the power source. And then from that central location, distribute to close by hydrogen refueling stations. That's the cheapest alternative, and that's you're not going to be spending two times, three times, or 20 times into energizing every single one of those electrolyzers, getting permitting for each one of those. It just becomes cost prohibitive. We've seen that already in California, and there's a departure from trying to cross uh, highways with new copper and put uh, uh, adapters or transformers near the gas stations. It's just not feasible. Just think about the cost of copper and think about what does the, in, 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 a, in a gas station or what it do, does maybe even in, near your wind uh, turbine. And your wind turbine may or may not be in land. It could be offshore. So if you start doing the, the math, it doesn't make sense. You should go to one centralized location for the overall distribution of hydrogen. So you yourself, you have a fairly diverse background. I read that you were uh, you used to work in fossil fuels, uh, but <laughs> mobile, <laughs> mobile devices, tactile That's technology, everywhere. power connectors, a number of different yeah. things. Yes. How did you end up in fuel cells and why? Uh, well, I'm a chemical engineer, so uh, I'm, I'm very dear, close to electrochemistry. However, we all started in the dark side at some point in life, and we had to work with uh, oil companies at some point, and eventually we saw the, the light, and we turned out to go to energy efficiency, to renewable power, and try to make it and trying to make a difference. It's not just about making money, it's about making a real change in the market. So yes, we went through the technology side and eventually power electronics and all that, touchscreens and so on. And for the last uh, 10 years, I've been involved in energy efficiency products and how to reduce our carbon footprint. And the last five years doing it with, with the Giener, it's been a pleasure to, to work with incredible people, which are, to me, the smartest guys on the planet. And now that we're being able to focus ourselves only on the electrolyzer side, not being distracted by regenerative fuel cells or lightweight electrolyzers for aer aerospace or other things, it makes it a, a, a real uh, joy to be able to apply it in a very profitable way with a great partner to actually make a, make a huge change in this marketplace. Wonderful. So for more information, I'd like to uh, direct you to the Ginner booth, which is at C36, which is just over by uh, the technical forum, um, just behind us uh, by a number of uh, rows. Please join me in, uh, in thanking uh, Mr. Hector Mazza for joining us on the stage today. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Nice job. Up next in the public forum will be a conversation with the chairman of the Spanish Hydrogen Association. He'll be speaking about uh, Spanish breakthroughs in hydrogen. So please stick around and enjoy.